from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So what I'm going to do first is just do a little introduction for the tape, and then we'll start. We'll just okay. start talking, and um, and we'll take it from there. And anytime you want to you want to stop, we can stop for as long okay. as Okay. Well. Okay. So today is August the fourteenth, two thousand thirteen. Uh, speaking is David Klein from the History Department at the University at Virginia Tech uh, in Blacksburg, uh, also working for the Southern Oral History Program at UNC Chapel Hill. Today I have the honor of interviewing uh, Kay Tillo here in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, behind the camera is John Bishop of Media Generation and UCLA. And I think that's everything. Is that everything? Yeah. I'm reading the paper on the couch from and oh, and uh, <laughs> uh, we're back here in the lovely home of um, Kay and Walter Tillo. So hello to Walter uh, as well, and thank you for having us back here. Um, so if we could just start, if you could just introduce yourself, um, your age, where you were born, and um, that would be great. And then we'll have a, a conversation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My name is Kay Tillo, and I was born in Paducah, Kentucky in uh, 1942 mm. and uh, my parents lived in uh, Metropolis, Illinois which was across the river from Paducah. Paducah was the closest hospital and I grew up in Metropolis, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And if you could tell us a little bit about your upbringing and if you see anything sort of in the way that you were raised, the family that, that you are from that may have um, caused you to become involved in the movement in later years? Well, um, I, my parents were of modest means. Uh, both of them were from farm families, of uh, uh, families that had come over from Germany and uh, were eager to uh, get land mm -hmm. <laughs> here. And uh, every uh, uh, German family had a plot of 80 acres. I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure how that happened, but uh, that's where my grandparents each lived on a farm. And uh, both of my parents grew up on the farm. And uh, my mom uh, was able to go to uh, Southern Illinois Teachers College um, and became a teacher. And my father uh, had a, he farmed and he also had a, a, a furniture store. So uh, we lived in, the, the town was very small, 6,000 people, and it's still 6,000 people. So uh, Metropolis is just a, you know, a farm town of, uh, and very, very far away from, you know, urban centers. It's like halfway between St. Louis and Memphis. And so the big city is Paducah, which is like 36,000. Hmm. So um, I went to grade school and high school there, and uh, my parents were involved and active in the church. Hmm. So um, I think perhaps one of the things that influenced me most was that we had a Presbyterian minister named Maynard Elftman, who at some point when I was in high school gave me a copy of the book the Wall Between by mm. Anne Braden. And uh, it was an amazing revelation to me <laughs> to, from those narrow confines. My family was not at all political in any way, so I didn't, I had no, you know, my family didn't talk about politics. They talked about morals and education, and those were the things in the church that guided them. But this book was eye-opening in terms of what was happening. And what kinds of things did, did Mrs. Braden talk about in that, and how did that affect you? Uh, well, she told the story of uh, inequality in Louisville, Kentucky, and how they had uh, purchased a home for an African-American family because the sellers would not sell it to them. So they purchased the home, and that brought this terrible... <laughs> Backlash, and well, everyone knows the story that the house was bombed. Uh, Carl and Ann were arrested. Carl went to prison, charged with sedition, uh, trying to overthrow the state of Kentucky. And uh, 
uh, but Anne wrote very well. So it, she always she approached it from kind of for someone who didn't understand any of these things at all. I could understand and very moving about uh, inequality and the you know the need to stand up against mm -hmm. what was wrong. So. Um, that was had a big influence on me, and that was before I gradu I graduated from high school in 1960. And what was the world? So, what was your immediate world around you um, there in Metropolis, as far as the demographics, as far as equality? Uh, what, what did you see around you, and how did that compare to what you were reading? Well, I just, I remember when uh, the grade schools were integrated uh, there when I was in grade school. And I remember, you know, people being very, very upset about that happening. Uh, but for a while, and then it seemed that that was over. But, uh, of course, the African-American teachers lost their jobs. And uh, I don't know when they were later hired, you know. I'm sure that at some point that was changed, too. Uh, the high school was integrated. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, so, you know, it was not, um, I don't think it was like the Deep South, but there was certainly prejudice there. I can remember uh, nominating a young African American to be the head of the, the what was it, the high try, some girls club mm -hmm. in high school, mm -hmm. and the teacher telling me, no, we weren't ready for that. <laughs> so that was in before 60. Very interesting. You know. Yeah. And that was that before you would have read the book, or mm, I don't know. I don't know that. Yeah. I can't remember how that remember fits your together. First, this is probably a difficult question, but do you remember your first sort of overt act? Well, um, I'm not sure exactly which one was first. I went to the University of Illinois then, mm. and um, by that time, I you know I joined the NAACP away from Metropolis, yes. Yes. <laughs> which was easier to do, you know. And uh, uh, particip I remember particip my first picket line mm. was at the University of Illinois against some store that wouldn't hire African Americans. And uh, I remember being very frightened, but believing it was right and I was going to do it. And uh, I remember what my sign said. Somebody, I didn't write it, but someone had given me the sign. It said, in the land of Lincoln, discrimination is stinking. <laughs> and uh, uh, not too much happened. I mean, we were kind of berated on the picket line. But we, you know, things by that time were beginning to happen in the country. And I just went to the meetings and learned. And we would have reports from... Uh, you know, people coming from the South, you know, who mm -hmm. would uh, speak at the meetings and tell some of the stories. And, you know, the, the movement was beginning to have impact all across the country and mm -hmm. in, uh, in Champaign, Illinois right. as well. <laughs> right. And so you, you talk about students visiting. Were there other ways that you were getting your news about what was happening? Mm, well, depending on... Uh, what year? Um, in 62, um, in the summer of 62, I was back in Metropolis and preparing to go to Ghana on a junior year abroad, right. which I went in 62. And, but during that summer before then, I went with the local NAACP because there were SNCC demonstrations in Cairo, which was about 40 miles away, and uh, we, we traveled to go, you know, we went to, we went to the court hearings. It was a segregated courtroom, and I remember being just amazed at the courage of these people. The, um, Mary McCullum was one of the people who was there, and she had a big, her, she had been cut on her thigh, a huge gash and during one of the demonstrations. And uh, just, you know, people were facing such brutality and were so strong. Um, you know, that was, that was it about the mm -hmm. Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. is that 
uh, you gained inspiration by these other people who you admired so and who were really, you know, risking everything to stand up for what they believed in. So that had a great impact on me um, during that summer. Then, you know, I went to Ghana and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was different. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was at the time the, um, he got a emeritus honorary degree there. He had mm -hmm. gone, there, gone there to work on his uh, Pan-African encyclopedia, I mm -hmm. think it mm -hmm. was. And uh, of course, I didn't know who he was. And all of the students said, you don't know, he's, he's America, you don't know, you know. I became aware of uh, some of the ignorance mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the, the holes in our education system that here was someone so highly regarded around the world and I had never heard. So I went to the ceremony where he was given that honorary degree mm -hmm. and he was there with his wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot, you know, in Africa from, I mean, Connor Cruz O'Brien was the uh, chancellor of the university and he had written to Katanga and back and, you know, all of that story. So I was just becoming aware of like the U.S. role in the world. And um, by the time I came back, which was uh, in 63, uh, two things happened on my way back. One was that... Uh, Du Bois died in August of 63 and the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. So I came back and, you know, the civil rights movement was in full <laughs> blossoming. And um, you, you, you arrived back after the, the march? Right, at the end of August, right afterwards, yes. And uh, so I went back to the University of Illinois. But somewhere along the way, I met John Lewis, who was, uh, came to the University of Illinois. I'm not sure which year that was, hmm. um, whether that was 63 or whether that was earlier, before 62, but I was very impressed. Again, uh, the people who were active in that movement were so inspiring and uh, compelling <laughs> mm -hmm. about uh, uh, what it meant and the value of, uh, of uh, this cause and this humanity. And uh, I was very moved by him. He had a lot of hair then too. <laughs> <laughs> now were the students in, in Accra following what was going on in the US? Yes. Um, they were. Of course, there, that was also the time of the missile crisis, mm. which they were, they were all asking me, why? <laughs> why? 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 You know, this danger of nuclear war. Mm. Why is this happening? But that, I can't remember a lot of discussions about the civil rights movement. But uh, they wanted to know why I had never heard of W.B. Du Bois. Right, right. And... Uh, uh, hmm. Okay, so back, so you get back to campus and in in, um, in sixty three. Right, and then my NAACP chapter decided to send a delegation uh, to Atlanta during the semester break, and um, the way I remember it is that we were going to go picket Lebs. I, I'm not even sure what Lebs was. I think it was a chain, a restaurant or something mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And we were going to go down there and see and report back, et cetera. And I went down uh, with some others from there. And uh, as a result of that visit where uh, I remember a discussion with Prathia Hall, mm -hmm. who was from Philly, she spoke and... Uh, Jim Foreman and, you know, lots of other people. And I made the decision that that's what I wanted to do. I couldn't stay in school. I had to go and <laughs> I had to go and help. Not that I knew what to do, but uh, that's how compelling the movement was. That uh, I remember we went to Hattiesburg mm -hmm. and um, at the time there were demonstrations over voting there and Hattiesburg was 
a very oppressive, violent place. When we were there, uh, Bob Moses had been in jail, mm -hmm. and there was a white man also in jail too, one from the movement, I can't remember his name, that he had been very badly beaten because they had put him in with the, the white, it was a segregated jail, and they put him in with the white mm -hmm. prisoners, and well, of course they told him he was involved with the civil rights, so he, he was really badly beaten. He could hardly be recognized as a human being. And we stayed with a family there in Hattiesburg, and um, the police, we picketed at the courthouse where they were trying to register, and the police marched in military ranks, you know, down the street like they were meeting uh, the enemy. And uh, I remember a, a gigantic mass meeting there in Hattiesburg with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. So was, there was this stark, you know, comparison between uh, this militarized opposition and the violence in the jail and these people who were not afraid, mm -hmm. a kind of, um, that was uh, very inspiring that uh, they gave each other courage and they were not afraid. They had us in their homes. They were under threats of violence. Of course, that was the area where Schwerner, Goodman and Cheney were killed not long after that. But uh, uh, there were hundreds of people and you could feel <laughs> mm. <laughs> that, you know, something was moving and shaking and turning and was not to be put back in spite of the violent opposition that it faced. Mm. Now in terms, did, did, you, did you identify as a Southerner? Uh, or how did you see yourself, and especially as you got into the, the, more, the deeper South from where you were from? Well, I guess I did. I mean, I... I uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I was sort of a <laughs> uh, betwixt and between, but uh, having been born in Kentucky, I claimed Kentucky as, as where I was born. Mm -hmm. um, but then as you got into a place like Hattiesburg, how did that compare to how you had, what you had seen growing up? Well, that was much, but there, of course there was no movement in Metropolis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say Cairo probably could have uh, vied with uh, Hattiesburg mm -hmm. for the brutality of the response to the movement, and that was very, that was Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I didn't see Metropolis with a movement there, really. Right. <laughs> Um, so I'm not sure. And I didn't know any white people in Hattiesburg mm -hmm. <laughs> other than the people that were in the movement. So so, so you, you went there just over a school break but decided that this is where I you needed to be. I decided I would go back, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, that's what I did. And uh, I kind of went, <laughs> people kind of went with the flow at the time, you know. Yeah. We were young and I certainly didn't have any particular skills to contribute, just myself, mm. <laughs> just going down and uh, trying to be there and learn from other people and try to help in whatever way that I could. So what was your first step? How did you find a, an assignment or what you were going to do? Well, uh, I was with a group that went kind of to these different places. Uh, I remember we went to Chapel Hill and... We went to Tuskegee, where they were preparing that Staunton Lind was there, mm -hmm. and they were preparing the uh, freedom schools that were going to happen that coming summer. Freedom Summer was in '64, so you know we kind of went to this place and that place, Chapel Hill. I think there was a student conference, and I was at Highlander several times, yeah. Yeah. which is where I met Walter. Oh, that's where you met? Yeah. <laughs> was it at, at a workshop, or what was, do you remember what the circumstances were? Yeah, well, I, 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 I guess it was a workshop. It was, by that time, I was working with uh, a group uh, called the Appalachian Committee for Full Employment, which was working with miners in eastern Kentucky. 
and uh, the people from SNCC came, and we all, you know, people came together and discussed the situation. I remember Jim Dombrowski being there. Mm -hmm. He was one of the old SCEF, SCEF people, and I met Carl and Ann. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they kind of weaved throughout all of it. They were really mentors to all of the young people uh, that were coming through the South. And uh, uh, they shared <laughs> mm -hmm. the Southern Patriot, which was their newspaper, and uh, their skills and their encouragement uh, to everybody that came through. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were really a tremendous force, I believe, in the rebuilding of the civil rights movement from the earlier 30s where the Southern Conference for Human Welfare and I think there was another a youth group and kind of they bridged the gap and kind of reconnected it mm -hmm. um, in that period of so time. So yeah, how, how did you as, as young people look at this sort of earlier generation of, of activists? Well, we had to learn about it because those of us who didn't come from, you know, Walter came from a left background. I came from the farm. Mm. <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> about anything. So we had to learn. And of course, uh, uh, Carl and Ann had us reading, you know, reading. And uh, what did you read? Trying to understand. Well, let's see. What did I read? Eleanor Flexner's A Century of Struggle mm -hmm. <laughs> on Women. Uh, we read a lot of stuff about the HUAC, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, Carl was very strong about, uh, you know, the 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 terrible uh, impact of anti-communism mm -hmm. uh, and its uh, ability to to flatten the progress in the country. And uh, of course, with what he had been through and that whole story about, you know, of his life and the sedition charge, etc. So Carl was very strong. I would say they were the big influence on SNCC, that, they, that the organization would not refuse to be anti-communist, you know, refuse to uh, adopt that kind of, uh, that liberal anti-communism of Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the, um, the organization that you said that you were working with, the, the Appalachian Committee, what, was the, what were they primarily working on at that, at that time? Well, at the time, um, I guess the reason I was attracted to it was there was an increasing discussion about um, economic, the economic situation and how important that was in terms of equality, mm -hmm. that you know, public accommodations was not winning equality and public accommodations would not end the inequality because there was an economic base to it. And of course, I had to learn that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was persuaded by that. And uh, there was a group that was organizing to, uh, there were, was a group of coal miners in Eastern Kentucky who had tried to revive the miners union mm -hmm. after it had been broken. And they had been arrested and, and uh, jailed on a, uh, charge of conspiracy. So there was a legal case and there was kind of a, a movement around it and I went there to help. I put out mm -hmm. a, a, a newspaper called, uh, I don't know, I think it was called Kentucky Jobs with Justice. Mm -hmm. And we, we worked on organizing there. I remember I was there, we marched on Frankfurt with uh, the people who organized from Louisville for there was a jobs march on Frankfurt for jobs and freedom, and that was March 5th of 1964. And we brought the contingent from mm -hmm. <laughs> from the coal fields of Appalachia and, and joined up with the other people. Mm -hmm. so. This is one of the pieces that I think sadly gets left out often in the story of the of the civil rights movement, especially. But you know, the march on Washington was the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. The, the, the fact that the economic piece from the very beginning was thought of as, as a part of this civil rights goal, um, it sounds like <coughs> you learned that early on in the, the work. Yeah, they, I remember there was a workshop we had at Highlander. Of course, Highlander, of course, had, been, had participated in the earlier days in the education 
of those who were the CIO trying to organize workers in the South and trying to organize uh, those agricultural movements, uh, black and white together and all. Uh, but so we had a conference during the SNCC era on unions. I remember we had someone from the United Electrical Workers who came down and talked with us and we had a discussion about, you know, how, uh, what, what role should unions play if, it, you know, in terms of trying to propel justice and equality in the country. Mm -hmm. So early on you became interested in working in Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 What year did you and Walter meet? 64. Okay. Somewhere in there. Yeah. I'm sort of, I know this gets personal, but I'm, I'm interested in how it works as a couple in the movement, and especially when you're being, you know, there's so much work to, to be done and you might be pulled to work in different places at different times. And how, how did that work for you? Uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, I don't know. We managed to <laughs> mm -hmm. find a way to put it together that, you know, by by uh, 65 and 66, you know, a lot of people were leaving SNCC. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Walter worked on that um, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 64. And in, in 66, I believe it was 66, I think we went to work for the Electrical Workers Union both of us. Of course, they sent me one place and him another. They sent him to Detroit and me to Pittsburgh, but <laughs> it still wasn't together. But uh, uh, after that period of time, you know, the uh, I think people didn't know exactly what to do in the South. It, there were different things happening mm -hmm. from uh, up to 64. Mm-hmm. So in, in terms of as SNCC started to change uh, it, a, a bit, um, but, uh, but it sounds like you were already focused on. Yeah, I know, was working on in, in East Kentucky, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for all of 64, basically. Mm -hmm. And would you, you'd catch up and see each other every so often? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't so far away. <laughs> right, right. And so then actually into working in a union, uh -huh. um, and how was that experience? Well, that was an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was another thing to learn. I worked in uh, northern Pennsylvania on a union drive there, and then uh, eventually we left the UE, and uh, I went to work in 69, for 1199, which was a civil rights related uh, union, the hospital workers. And um, the interesting thing about the union, the union basically was a progressive union and was built um, among African American workers in the hospital service workers in New York, uh, dietary housekeeping, nursing assistants, etc. And uh, we worked on uh, establishing the union in Pennsylvania where it was not majority black situation. And uh, amazingly enough, we found that we were able to build a union mm. even in vast majority white hospitals, not in Pittsburgh, but the first one that we won was in Lewistown, which was almost all white. Mm. And that was against a, you know, a campaign by the employer for that this was a black union and, you know, mm -hmm. all of that was happening. Um, but that was an interesting experience. We were able to build the union in uh, rural areas in Pennsylvania. Um, and how, is, how are rural areas of Pennsylvania in terms of their race relations? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. We, I worked in Wilkes-Barre where we organized the registered nurses and all of the, the whole hospital. Uh, that was one of the early ones. And, uh, the, you know, the, uh, that was Mercy Hospital um, in Wilkes-Barre. 
I remember they campaigned against the union by saying that the nurses are professionals and we've, we've worked hard to come away from being called cold crackers. Hmm. And of course that made the nurses livid because their fathers had sent them to nursing school on uh, coal miner mm -hmm. salaries. So mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, we won there. We won there and in Butler, um, oh, I can't think of the other towns. Spangler, Huntington, Washington, Washington, Pennsylvania, and Cannonsburg were hospitals where in the not big cities but mm -hmm. more rural areas where we were a part of the Union. And the, the rest of the Union was African American uh, in Baltimore. You know, Baltimore was one of the first, uh, I think, the, one of the first outside of New York City. I remember Coretta King went there and helped the campaign, and Johns Hopkins was organized into 1199. That was probably 69 or 70. Mm -hmm. And then there was an 1199 campaign in Charleston, South Carolina. And around the same time, or a little bit earlier than that, I think, and they were not able to win union recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a huge, you know, a huge battle, but they, they didn't break it down. There was some kind of a settlement that they would um, uh, allow the union to have, to collect dues or something. It didn't, it didn't build the basis for establishing the union in the South, and it, it's still unorganized. And of course, Kentucky, the hospital workers are almost all unorganized. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, very hard <laughs> mm -hmm. to do that uh, mm -hmm. in, the southern, in the southern states. Mm -hmm. David, let's pause for a minute. Okay. I want to change this to some recording. Okay. okay, well, David, it's recording. And, uh, this is just an aside, but I've done a bunch of work in, um, in southwest Georgia with the SNCC folks down there and um, Charles Sherrod. And oh, Michael. yeah. And um, he, one of the reasons he admitted to me, one of the reasons that he went to, you know, went north to, to seminary was to recruit people to come down. And part of what he needed was vehicles. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> right? so, but, but you're starting to say, are we, are we back? Oh, great. Um, I was asking about, or we mentioned uh, off camera just for a second that we were talking about the importance of Highlander and I was talking about it being in a rather remote place and, but you, and you were starting to talk about how people got around in those days. So. Oh, well, uh, Highlander, at the, at, during that period, it was in Knoxville. Mm. You know, I, oh, okay. so uh, it was uh, earlier, you know, where it was burned down. I, I, I think that was in Mon Eagle, Tennessee. Yeah, but yeah, near Sewanee, right. It yeah. was in a, a big house in Knoxville at the time when we were going. And I think it's somewhere else now. I haven't been there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think New Market or somewhere. Not far from that. Although I have been back. I um, went back because my friend who I work with on single payer is from Tennessee and he invited us back. We went to a play about Miles Horton and Don yeah. West <laughs> and that was somewhere near um, that area. And uh, we went to the grave of uh, of Miles Horton mm. and and saw where the the school had originally been. I I have a picture of Walter and me with the the marker. You know, there's mm -hmm. a historical marker there. Yeah, in Mont Eagle. Yeah, it's in Mont Eagle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah, which leads me to ask a question too. I mean, the the work that you were doing with the nurses union, in which you clearly saw as uh, civil rights activity. Um, did the nurses see it that way? And then, and what other, um, or the or the hospital workers? And who who were your allies in working on these campaigns? Did, did some of the other civil rights mm -hmm. uh, organizations support you or not? Yeah, yeah. I remember well in Pittsburgh when we first started in you know '69. Uh, the other unions were uh, not sympathetic because here was a union, it was a New York based union and you know we had organized a petition from some hospital workers to ask them to come and help us and 
they were all excited about, uh, you know, coming. So they came and put me onto the staff. But the other unions in the city were not sympathetic because they saw it as their territory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the allies were the UE was mm -hmm. very sympathetic. And um, David Montgomery at the time was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And he, he and the guy from Tom Quinn from the United Electrical Workers headed up the support committee for us because uh, at the time in 1969 and 70, there were, there were, the National Labor Relations Law did not cover hospital workers. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, to get recognition, you had to really build, mm -hmm. you know, a, a movement that had some strategy of forcing the hospital on moral or mm -hmm. uh, grounds to, to recognize the union, which is what they had done in New York. You know, they had more power there and they got Rockefeller to back it and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, they were able to do it. Uh, we uh, were not able to win in, uh, in 70. There was a strike at Presbyterian Hospital and we were not able to, you know, gain collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. But as a result of the strike, uh, the governor of Pennsylvania at that time, his name was Schaap, mm -hmm. and um, they were contemplating uh, collective bargaining for state employees at the time. And as a result of that strike, they added hospital workers. So hmm. Pennsylvania became a state that included, uh, under state law, the right for uh, hospital workers to organize. and. Hmm. It was not until 1975, I think it was 75, I think that's right, that the NLRB was amended its coverage mm -hmm. and made it possible to organize in mm -hmm. hospitals across the country. But So our movement was a part of, you know, opening that door and making that happen. What were the racial demographics among hospital workers? I mean, was were there a majority of African Americans in in the field? Well, in uh, it, 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 it varied in yeah. Pittsburgh. Probably thirty percent or forty percent were African American among the service workers. I mean, we weren't organizing in among the nurses in mm. Pittsburgh. We, I mean, we couldn't reach them, uh, but. Uh, it wasn't majority. It wasn't like you could just unite mm. African American workers and then you had majority, which I think is how it was in New York. So it was a new, <laughs> a okay. new, a new challenge. But uh, you know, I think that's mm. something we were proud of was that we did build the union. That other hospital workers called on us. People from Uniontown called. We started a movement there and. Uh, People were all related to coal miners and had a union tradition in their families mm -hmm. and didn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted a union, you know. And right. There was a strike in Uniontown as well, also which was not one, but was a valiant effort. It was amazing that in Uniontown, as a part of that, um, that effort, we had, you had to strike for recognition because before the law, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you, were, you couldn't get an election. You had no way to gain, no established way to gain collective bargaining rights. So um, I remember there's a part of the effort to get the hospital to settle the, the work. We would go out to the various um, enterprises of the people who were on the board of the hospital and somebody from the coal mine was there, you know, so mm -hmm. we went, we could close down the the coal mine closed down the mm. uh, the clothing factory. We could close down anything right. in the city except the hospital was still functioning because it wasn't a solid, hmm. you know, a solid strike. And that was what happened in uh, Pittsburgh as well. It wasn't a solid majority that went out, mm -hmm. but it did. Be, we did win. Um, we won uh, the first uh, union that was established was at the Jewish Home and Hospital for the Aged in uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, oh, it, w it was a lovely campaign. That w w that was a majority African American workers, 
And uh, that campaign was led by Henry Nicholas, who's now the, the head of the Hospital Workers Union in Philadelphia. But before the Philadelphia Union was established, mm. you know, uh, Nicholas came to uh, help us in the Pittsburgh area. And this was an area where uh, clearly the civil rights movement was a part of people's thinking mm. and very responsive to that. And uh, since we didn't, couldn't get a vote, but we had a clear majority, we had a sit-in. It was on Christmas Eve in 1969, hmm. and we, I mean, we were, it was solid. It was an amazingly uh, strong movement, mm -hmm. and uh, we were sitting there and then told management, you know, if there were any emergencies, we would send someone to help, but other than that, you know, and the woman from the laundry kept coming through and said the laundry had to be done. <laughs> we said that wasn't an emergency. They could go with that. And uh, by the end of the day, we had an agreement with the management that they would conduct an election. We found um, a rabbi from Road of Shalom who was going to hold this election. And we had a date set for sometime in January or February to that we would have a secret ballot election and an agreement that if a majority voted for it, they would recognize the sure. union and bargain. And yeah, that was our big, that's really why we could establish the union there, because we finally won something. Mm -hmm. And that opened the door. <laughs> and that yeah. meant that we had a, you know, we had several hundred, I can't remember how many it was, a couple of hundred members there at that nursing home. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the union in Pennsylvania. But it was shortly after that that they passed the law uh, in 70 or 71. And then we began winning uh, under the law, under the state law in Lewistown and Wilkes-Barre and mm -hmm. uh, in 73 in Washington and, you know, a number of other hospitals and built the union. and. Many of those bargaining units were majority white, which is uh, something we're proud of that, mm -hmm. you know, gave you hope that you could unite people on economic issues uh, with some understanding of civil rights issues mm -hmm. and make a common fight for justice within the country. Mm -hmm. Now, as you, as you brought people together to form the unions and, and brought the communities together, did that ever lead communities... Um, create unity within those communities that led them on to other issues, to fight other kinds of battles that you know. I don't know. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm Just sorry. I, yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, okay. I think that in, in general, uh, we built solidarity for other workers, mm -hmm. you know, so that we would demonstrate with other unions or other people trying to get the union or, you know, bring people together around those issues. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, I was, just, yeah, I, I was just curious about how empowering it is to take on other issues. But, <laughs> okay, so... Um, how did, you know, we started by talking about your family. How did your family um, back home uh, respond to the work that you had decided to devote yourself to? Um, well, they were not happy about it. <laughs> uh, uh, my mother mainly because I had left school before I graduated. Mm. And I didn't finally graduate from college until 67. Uh, so I had left before my last semester, <laughs> and my mother was very upset about that. Uh, it was that, and also concern about it was dangerous, you know, and uh, they were uh, not happy about it at all. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was difficult. Uh, because it was not the norm <laughs> mm -hmm. that had been planned. Well, even Walter's parents, who 
had much more understanding about the movement were frightened about the situation and uh, worried about that. And then, you know, there were other problems about movement people. I remember, you know, we were also involved in the anti-war movement. And in the, in the days of the anti-war movement, I mean, it was terrible what, what would happen. Uh, the FBI went to see my parents about this. So that doesn't help mm -hmm. <laughs> the situation where they were questioned. And, you know, they didn't have, you know... <laughs> anyway, any uh, context in which to place that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it created a great deal of difficulty. They were questioned about, you know, the picket lines against the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, and then, do you remember them getting in touch with you and telling you what? Yes, I remember, went? you know, my mother crying on the phone and I'm trying to explain. And the FBI has just left their house and been questioning them. and. You know, they think that I'm, you know, in some kind of terrible trouble and mm -hmm. that the, F, you know, they never had run-ins with the law. <laughs> you know, they, they uh, that was completely different to them. And, of course, that was what it was about. Mm -hmm. They were trying to repress, you know, make it difficult for people to participate mm -hmm. in such a movement. Now, did you see... The various things that you were involved in, like the anti-war movement, but also the labor organizing, civil rights, did you see this as all of a, of a piece or a separate Yeah, thing? I saw it as all connected. Mm -hmm. For me it was. The same folks that, you know, <laughs> uh, they were the same people that were concerned about the same issues. I think that the civil rights movement was the foundation of the ability of people to do the other organizing. I think that that was uh, the catalyst and the strength and the momentum. That was the powerful movement mm -hmm. that really uh, changed the country, made it totally different, and made it possible for people to do these, these other kinds of things. Um, it, it was, you know, what was out there in front and uh, uh, with a moral compulsion mm -hmm. and uh, made it possible for the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, all of the other kinds of things that, that followed uh, were grounded in <laughs> and took their strength from, you know, they were connected to what the civil rights movement had done. The power of common people moving together is very compelling and uh, gives you all kinds of ideas about what you might change. <laughs> uh, you know, seeing uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, I saw her many times, and knowing her story of what she had been through, what, where does a person gain that strength? You know, where does that come from? That someone of such humble origins could give such leadership uh, that really shook the nation and changed it. I mean, she changed that, you know, that, uh, that uh, convention, uh, you know, when she said, we didn't come all this way for two seats, you know. Uh, that a woman from that background could say that. I, you say, my goodness, doesn't take, you know, you don't have to be Einstein. You can, <laughs> you know, that, that we have within the nation many people, many people, all kinds of people who could become movers mm -hmm. to make things happen differently in the country. Mm -hmm. Capable of creating extraordinary change. Pardon? Capable of creating a Yes, and that really, the whole civil rights movement was that way, you know. It really was about uh, uh, people who had fewer resources mm -hmm. on which, you know, to rely. Uh, but so much strength in that movement. I mean, you think about the, um, the Freedom Riders. 
I, I'll never forget the, the Diane Nash story, you know, when the, the, she's called by the Justice Department and she, they, they say, you know, you can't do this, you can't pick up this ride, you, you could be killed. And she says, uh, we know that, we are aware, we have all made out our wills. Yeah, that's just powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that was there on a, a massive basis, not just one or two or three leaders, but many, 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 many people. So that changed the country. Mm -hmm. And I think propelled the other movements that have been asking or asserting their rights within the country mm -hmm. uh, as well. Did you ever personally interact with the, with the women's movement? Okay. Um, I was involved in the pay equity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, uh, and uh, Coalition of Labor Union Women. I was the president in Pittsburgh of the Coalition of Labor Union Women. And we carried on quite mm -hmm. a bit. <coughs> what kinds of things did you work on? Well, uh, it was a time when uh, labor union women didn't have any role at all in the officialdom, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember so many times I would get up to speak at the Allegheny's Central Labor Council and couldn't get recognition, you know, or they would say it wasn't the right time on the agenda to, <laughs> to raise that issue. I mean, there was, it was difficult. So the Coalition of Labor Union Women, which was founded in 74, um, Kind of. Just take a. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. You said the, the Coalition of Labor Union Women was formed in. Uh, the Coalition of Labor Union Women was founded in 1974. I went to the founding. I think we were in Detroit. I'm not sure where we were. <laughs> Those hotels all look the same. But uh, it gave us a way for union women to form an organization and to speak on behalf of, you know, women's issues, whatever. So that's kind of what we did. A number of chapters in Clue became kind of the focal point of women who were concerned about civil rights and anti-war as well as union issues. And we had a dynamic chapter in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Pittsburgh and uh, they were always telling us we were, <laughs> we were getting out of line. But it was, it was a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it, you were laughing about not being recognized, but I imagine that that, that must have been terribly frustrating at, at times, given what you were working on. The, well, uh, just, just funny memories of, you know, the way things were, you know. I mean, I love the labor movement, but, you know, when you know it, you know all of its problems as well. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, that was one of its difficulties. Some progress has been made on that, but, you know, there are big problems within the labor movement. We have so much, so much to do. So many workers unorganized, and uh, uh, so little. Be we're losing ground in terms of, uh, you know, uh, wages compared mm -hmm. to where all the money is going to the top. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you're, you're still working in the in the movement, correctly? Or, or yeah, I'm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I worked on the the. Uh, trying to build the union, the nurses union here in, in uh, Louisville. But uh, right now I'm working on uh, uh, the single payer movement, you know, the effort to finally win in our nation <laughs> universal health care, to make health care a right for every person and to win a, um, a system where we would publicly fund it so that we would remove the economic barriers to getting care and make certain that everyone could get care uh, regardless of ability to pay. And uh, that's the effort now that uh, mm -hmm. I'm working on. There's a bill in Congress called uh, H.R. 676, sponsored by the wonderful <laughs> Congressman John Conyers, who also introduced the, uh, the uh, Martin Luther King holiday mm -hmm. bill and has led many. He introduced the Shorter Work Week, which we worked with him back in a while back, mm -hmm. <laughs> decades ago. But he has introduced this bill, which would uh, uh, remove the private for-profit insurance industry from our healthcare system. 
and remove the for-profit hospitals so that it would you couldn't profiteer in healthcare. Mm -hmm. You could earn a living if you worked, mm -hmm. but you couldn't uh, make profit from denying care. And of course, that's the system that we have now. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the issue of healthcare unites people uh, because it touches all of us mm -hmm. and that it may be a place where we can break through and once again learn how to make, do big, important things instead of just talking as though it's only possible to get tiny, tiny, mm -hmm. tiny incremental change because nothing else is politically feasible. And of course, from my background, I know that with masses of people in motion, you can change it, <laughs> you know. It, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, so that's what we're working to build that movement that makes it possible to pass that bill. It seems that there are a few things that shouldn't be run as businesses. Health care, education, the military even, are not, should not be run as businesses. Could you speak to that issue? Or do you think that we have to go smaller steps before we get to I'm not, we're, I'm, I'm not thinking about small. I think we should step as big as we can. Um, and I agree with that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'm tremendously concerned about the direction of education because I think public schools are being undermined by these uh, charter for-profits, you know, privatization of, uh, of our education. And I was really cheering for those wonderful Chicago teachers mm -hmm. who took that on and who built uh, the bonds between the community mm -hmm. and the parents and the needs of the children and the teachers uh, uh, as all on the same side and wanting to have, you know, a, a way to teach and also a way that people could earn a living by teaching without being, you know, so kicked around. And I agree that on the military, these subcontracting in the military is, is terrible and the wars are terrible too. But healthcare, I don't know. It's one I, because I'd worked, you know, with all these healthcare workers, and I became aware, you know, working with nurses here in Louisville, uh, of the profit motive was understaffing these nursing mm -hmm. units, mm -hmm. so that you know we always said that even the 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 most excellent nurse can be overworked to the point of incompetence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it's certainly true, and of course, if you're, you know, these hospitals at the time were owned by Humana, which was a profit-making company, right. and so of course they staffed as slim as they could, mm -hmm. and that meant that there wasn't uh, enough of the nurse to give to all of the patients, and patient care suffers. Of course, since then we've, you know, nurses knew it all along, but since then they've done some studies that show you know, uh, deaths and infections and all of those things rise when the nurse staffing goes down in re relationship to the numbers of patients. So anyway, it should not be a, a for-profit business mm -hmm. and it needs to be run in the interest of patient care and of wellness and prevention. And John Conyers, I am proud. <laughs> he, he's introduced this bill. It was first introduced in 2003, oh, wow. and yeah. we've been working to build the movement around it. And I picked up on the issue around uh, to build union support, because I think that that's a key. We need the union support to make it happen. So uh, we started building the All Unions Committee for Single Payer Health Care, HR 676, and the first group I got to endorse it was my Clue chapter and the Chicago Clue chapter, and then we got the National Clue to mm -hmm. <laughs> endorse it, the Coalition of Labor Union Women, then we got friends who were in the uh, Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and they took it to their convention. So with those two union groups, we began to try to get uh, other unions, and uh, at this point, we have gotten, these are endorsements of H.R. 676, the Conyers bill. We have 605 unions that have endorsed that bill. 43 state AFL-CIO federations. Mm -hmm. 
and 146 central labor councils and I think 22 of the international unions and we're still working on it mm -hmm. because um, we're still not there. Mm -hmm. the, the bill that was passed doesn't solve the problem of bringing care to everyone nor of cutting the costs and so many people can't get care because they can't pay. Even many who have insurance right. can't pay the co-pays and deductibles mm -hmm. are they're barriers to the ability to to get care. You know, it's the country has adopted this insurance company thinking that the problem why it's so costly is because people are using the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it isn't the reason at all. The fact is that, you know, people in countries that pay half as much per capita as we do for health care their people have more days in the hospital, more doctor's office visits, et cetera. Right. So the problem isn't that people are utilizing the health care. That's an insurance company way of thinking. If anyone uses it, they're losing money. So the job is to put barriers up so they won't go. So I think we're winning on that too. I mean, we're a, a ways away and there are lots of people who say, okay, that just isn't politically feasible. You have to set your sights on something lower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say, but something lower won't solve the problem. And the job is to bring universal health care to our people. And of course, that would do so much in terms of the disparity between African Americans and whites mm -hmm. in this country. If we could at least get that right. And you know, the fight for health care has the amazing ability to do that. I just became aware re recently that in 65, when Medicare was passed, and all of a sudden all these seniors had money <laughs> to pay for hospitalizations, they wrote into the law that the hospital couldn't, couldn't get money if they were a segregated hospital. So all of a sudden, the, the hospitals of the South, they're integrated because they couldn't get the money. And here was federal money that was available to them. So, I mean, we can change all kinds of things with health care mm -hmm. if we can uh, make certain that everybody has a right to get that. And I'm aware of the studies. They're just awful. I looked at uh, a study by um, David Satcher. You know, he was yeah. Um, yeah. Surgeon General mm -hmm. and someone who was here in Louisville, uh, Ottawali Troutman. And I don't know what year the study is, but the study said, I think it was that there were 83,000 excess deaths in the African American community, deaths that would not have occurred had there been equality. And of course, that's related to the healthcare system. Other things too, but mm -hmm. a large part to the lack of access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. And it's just a crime. And um, I'm hopeful that we'll find a way to build the movement that can change that. Mm -hmm. And that maybe in the doing, <laughs> we might stimulate, mm -hmm. uh, open some other doors to, mm -hmm. to end the wars and to win justice and to win back the voting rights that are now threatened. And, uh, you know, it seems to me you have to go forward or you'll go backward. And I think we face that now, mm -hmm. in, uh, certainly within the labor union movement. And, and the voting rights decision is just heartbreaking. And we have to get ourselves together and, mm -hmm. and uh, refight that battle. How, how do you carry on? I mean, you personally, in terms, what, what are your sources of strength to keep, to keep fighting? Well, I have a husband. <laughs> <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, you know, he's kind of amazing at uh, his ability uh, to, keep, to keep going and uh, uh, even stronger than I am, I think, in many ways. 
And I've learned a lot from him, you know. He came from a different perspective on uh, all of this. People laugh, you know. He hasn't lost his New York accent. <laughs> so he still sounds like he just walked out of the Bronx. And I don't know, maybe I sound like I st just walked out of Paducah. So, <laughs> And we never picked up each other. Sometimes we don't even know, you know, what word you're saying. Could you repeat that? <laughs> Try to get it together. But I think lots of couples met in the South, I mm. think, you know, during that period of time when we all kind of got mixed up and lifted up <laughs> in a major way, lifted by a movement, um, you know, that was happening around it, through which we learned. I mean, you know, I would say I gained more from the movement than I gave because mm -hmm. when I walked into it, I didn't know what to give or how to give. I was just there. Mm -hmm. um, but we all learned and became better people and uh, uh, more knowledgeable about mm. what others had done before us and what could be done and what needed to be done uh, within our country. So we've been working on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think is interesting is, you know, obviously the movement didn't have a pension plan. So now you've got, you know, people who devoted their lives to the movement are at a you know at a place in their lives where for some people that we've talked to they're really struggling yeah, yeah i'm sure yeah. um well see from the point at which i went to work for the union movement mm -hmm. i was uh had a fairly regular <laughs> income yeah. Yeah. and uh pension but i know many people are in that kind of a situation well we need to expand social security mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, many people who had good pension plans in the auto industry or the steel industry or everywhere else, it's all under threat now. I mean, those, those pension plans are going under. People are getting a small percentage and Social Security isn't adequate to do it. So, um, which is why we've been working on a resolution to the AFL-CIO uh, for the upcoming convention that says, um, protect Social Security and Medicare, and the way in which you do that is that Social Security, we need to expand the tax so that it doesn't cut off at 100000 or whatever that figure is, so that all wages are taxed, so it's not a regressive tax, and that capital gains and interest is taxed as well, and that that will save, certainly save Social Security and allow us to enhance the benefits. And that uh, Medicare will be saved if we put everyone into Medicare. Um, and that's the expanded and improved Medicare for all, which is the single payer plan, H.R. 676, introduced by Congressman Conyers, that both of those can be saved and that it calls on the AFL-CIO to call for a march on Washington to promote these causes. So... Do you think that'll happen? Well, we got eight <laughs> central labor councils to send in that resolution. And um, I think people agree with that. Mm. I don't think that, I don't think we have things in motion to where people are thinking bigger, mm. but they're going to have to start doing that mm -hmm. because we can't just hang on. We can't even hang on to what we have mm. unless we start moving people uh, to try to improve mm -hmm. um, what we have. I think the, um, the, the, there's a tremendous effort to um, use immigrants now in much the way they used to use African Americans to try to divide people and there's an ugly anti-immigrant movement. Mm -hmm. But I think we can win people there too uh, to be Pro, that's part of what's in the Conyers bill is that, you know, it doesn't exclude anybody. You know, the Affordable Care Act says if you're not, uh, if you don't have a legal document, you can't even buy mm, right. insurance. Right. So anyway, basically we take the money that uh, uh, immigrant workers who are undocumented pay into Medicare and Social Security and they never... <laughs> They never get it back because they they don't uh, 
they're not able to collect on those on those benefits. Yeah. Okay. I actually think we might. Um, Can I ask yeah. one more question? Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that's most troubling is the number of African American males in prison. Do you have any perspective on that? Um, well, I would agree that it's that it's very troubling. Uh, I'm not particularly knowledgeable. I know that the numbers have increased tremendously, and um, I was happy to see that the judge in, I guess she's in New York, she's in that district, threw out the stop and frisk, and that there is, uh, 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 people are raising this issue. Uh, it's very troubling that uh, there are so many uh, African Americans in prison, and uh, we need to do something uh, to change that situation. Clearly, many of them are uh, innocent or are sentenced far beyond what is deserved for whatever they committed. And uh, it's, it's terrible. It's the way the nation has decided to deal with the problems of joblessness and, and you know, disruption of families and lives in communities where, you know, we have huge unemployment levels, which uh, has a terrible impact. We don't have equality in education so that we're opening the doors for a healthier life, and um, it's a terrible problem. I, I wish I knew exactly what we could do. I'm ready to work on it uh, because I think it really, it really is a huge problem. Well, this has been a, a remarkable interview, I think, especially underlining the centrality of economic justice to the, to the movement. Um, I want to ask you if, if there's something I didn't ask or I should have asked or anything that you'd like to, to add at this point. Uh, any questions you were expecting? That no, I appreciate <laughs> the opportunity to talk about this. I mean, I haven't thought about many of these things for a very long time, but I'm glad you're doing this, and uh, I'm sure you have other people to, uh, who played much more prominent roles. You know, I'm mm. just a little piece of it. Uh, but that, I mean, I think that's that was that is something that's really come out in the project uh, strongly is, is uh, what a movement is made of, right? Or all the little mm -hmm. the, the people doing their pieces, right? and how it's all they all connect. Great, thank you. Yes, thank well, you so much. thank you. Perfect. I hope we weren't too threatening. <laughs> well, well I, I had fun. I don't know whether, Good. you know, I probably should have thought more about. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.